皆さん、こんにちは。<coughs> Yo, as you may know, a lot of time goes into making each of my videos, and it's hard to get traction since I can't release that often. It would mean a lot to me if you could share this video, leave a like, maybe a comment, and if you want to see more runs in the future, consider subscribing. With that being said, please enjoy the video. Do you like Dark Souls? Are you a weeb? Do you like having a complex class and stat system that you can only truly understand by methodically testing out every single weapon, armor, and class combination yourself because the stat displays are oxymoronically verbose and vague at the same time? Are you a fucking weeb? Then Code Vein is the Souls like Jiggle Physics Simulator for you. Just like any other anime, Code Vein allows your petite and otherwise unassuming character to swing around huge meat tenderizers like they're nothing. But can you beat Code Vein without using a weapon? Of course you can, because Ultra Fan Service Waifu Chan can just smother enemies to death with her breasts without you even having to get off your fat ass. But what if I got rid of all that degenerate shit? Can you beat Code Vein without using a weapon or a partner? Now, that's what I put in the title, but I want a real challenge, so I'm cranking things up a notch. Can you beat Code Vein without weapon attacks, rifle shots, partners, drain attacks, parries, or weapon technique like gifts? Ladies and degenerates, welcome to the Code Vein Gifts Only Run. So, for those of you who haven't played Code Vein, you're probably wondering what gifts are. Gifts are basically the spells of this game, which are tied to different classes called blood codes. As your typical amnesia stricken anime protagonist, you have the special ability to utilize a multitude of blood codes and thus a variety of gifts. Gifts can range from blasts of magic to passive buffs to weapon techniques, which, because they use a weapon, aren't allowed in this run. Gifts are the only way I can inflict damage, and trust me, it's not as simple as a mage class run. Without overloading you with too much information right now, let's get into the run. Along with the competent, friendly AI, one of the best features of Code Vein is the character creation system. Gone are the days of looking like a horrendous fiend that was dragged across the asphalt, and welcome to the future of dunking on your enemies as a cute anime girl. Or, in my case, a sentient gift box whose only vocalizations are the cringe tsundere screams that I chose specifically to make this run just that much more difficult to complete. Man. These cutscenes are fucking hilarious. Instead of displaying the crazed, bloodlust induced facial expressions while literally shedding blood to protect the trees, my character has the constant appearance of absolute, unfeeling stoicism. Anyway, fan service Chan and I were captured and brought to the first area of the game, the ruined city underground. Upon gaining control of my character, I immediately dismissed my partner Oliver before he could have any impact on the run. Next, I flung myself through the level and talked to Louie, another partner that I also quickly dismissed because if he is not dismissed here, he will appear during the first boss fight. Now that I had rid myself of any potential friendship, it was time to start training. You start the game with three different blood codes that are pretty self-explanatory. Fighter, Ranger, and Caster. Blood codes govern most of your stats as well as what gifts you can use, but you can transfer most of the gifts to other blood codes after you have mastered them. Mastering a gift is done simply by equipping it and killing enemies in any way you want. You don't actually have to use the gift that you're training. Here's the catch though. Some gifts are incompatible with certain blood codes due to the stat requirements not being met. What that meant for me was that, in order to master the health boost gift in the fighter blood code, which did not have any projectile gifts and thus no way for me to attack, I had to master another blood code's projectile gift. However, I can't use the caster strong projectiles in the fighter blood code because the fighter blood code doesn't have the required stats to use them. So what I had to do was master the caster blood code, transfer those gifts over to the ranger blood code, master the ranger blood code, and then move the ranger's very weak sonic arrow gift over to the fighter blood code in order to finally master the health boost gift. Trust me, we are only getting started with the mountain of bullshit I had to deal with. You might be thinking, why don't you just overlevel and crush everything with the highest stats? Well, Code Vein doesn't make things so simple. When you level up in Code Vein, you don't get to pick which stats are raised. Instead, you just get a very small increase to your baseline stats. Which, okay, fine, but there's a bigger problem. The main reason I tried to keep my level as low as possible was due to a hidden game mechanic called Field Mechanics. You see, if you surpass the hidden level cap for an area, you can no longer master gifts in that location, 
and mastering gifts was extremely important because I didn't know when I might get cucked by a boss's bullshit. So I wanted to have all possible gifts at my disposal in any blood code I may use. Because of this logic, I never leveled above the field cap for any area in the game out of sheer paranoia. After mastering all the gifts I had, it was time to fight the first boss, Oliver Collins, whose incel energy was finally unleashed after I rejected him in the beginning of the game. This was where it became obvious that players were never meant to attempt a run like this. Gifts consume Icker, which is basically the stand-in for mana in this game. Your maximum Icker, regardless of what blood code you might use, is capped at a pretty low amount, and it doesn't auto-regenerate. The main way you are supposed to get Icker in the game is by inflicting damage upon your opponents or draining them with your Blood Veil. But of course, I'm not allowed to do either of those as per the rules. Instead, I could get Icker one of three ways. One way was to take damage, which obviously wasn't the preferred option since everything in this game hits like an Isekai truck. The second way I could gain Icker was to use a consumable called Icker Concentrate, which restores your Icker by 6, enough to use one or two projectile gifts. Thankfully, it's possible to farm Icker Concentrates off the very first enemies in the game. Unthankfully, you can only carry 5 Icker Concentrates at a time, and sadly, even if you begin the fight with a full Icker bar, it's not even close to enough to bring Oliver down. So, I had to resort to a third method of gaining Icker, a technique I called Guard Draining, which is simply blocking enemy attacks and gaining Icker from each successful block. This was easy enough, as most attacks could be blocked and the attacks that couldn't were pretty well telegraphed. But even this was not enough, because despite using a massive cinder block, I still took chip damage and would eventually die before having enough Icker to take him down. I alleviated this issue with two further strategies. The first was utilizing a game mechanic called Focus, which is a meter that fills up whenever I took damage or narrowly dodged an attack, the latter obviously being preferred. After enough attacks are dodged, my character enters a Focus state. This state gives a lot of honestly negligible buffs, but I was able to equip a passive gift called Dark Impulse, which raised the attack power of Dark Gifts whenever I was focused. Because I was virtually required to maximize the amount of damage I could inflict with the minimal Icker I could obtain, I only attacked while in a focus state, which meant deliberately putting myself in danger in order to dodge attacks and build focus. The second strategy I used to lessen chip damage was by utilizing two different builds, one for attacking and one for guard draining. The attack build used the Queenslayer Blood Veil and the Caster Blood Code to boost gift damage, along with the Pipe of Thraldom to increase mobility and iframes while dodging, while the Icker Draining Defense build used the Blue Hound's Blood Veil, the Fighter Blood Code, and the Hammer of Thraldom to maximize my defense. Even with this high defense, however, not all of the attacks were blockable, and I still took chip damage while barely gaining any Icker. Combined with the clumsiness of menuing to switch out gear and blood codes, it was a rough start to the run. Here's what the fight looked like. First, I entered attack mode, dodging all attacks until I reached a focus state, at which point I would fire as many blood shots as I could before my focus state ran out. I would repeat this until I had hit 11 blood shots, which brought the boss just above 60 HP. Past that point, Oliver transforms into his second phase, gaining higher attack and defense stats. Before that could happen, I guard drained as much Icker as I could in my defensive setup, watching my stamina gauge and regenerating my health from the chip damage that was inflicted. Because the fighter blood code had a lower Icker cap than the caster blood code, I used two Icker concentrate after switching to my attack setup in order to have the maximum amount of Icker going into phase 2. To initiate Phase 2, I used Blazing Roar, a gift that has a lower damage per Icker rate, but a higher damage output from a single use, allowing me to get the most out of my final attack on the weaker Phase 1 defense stats. I then continued the cycle of building up focus and shooting focus bloodshots during the boss's second phase. Once I ran out of Icker, I used the rest of my Icker concentrate and had just enough Icker to bring Oliver Collins down. And with that, I had defeated the first boss. Yeah, that's right, all of that just for the first boss, and things are only going to get more difficult from here on out. This run was so complicated that I literally kept a notebook with damage calculations and different builds. Thankfully, the rest of the fights don't have that much more complexity to them, so if you're feeling lost, don't worry. Also, for the sake of simplicity, I'm not going to mention all of the different attack gifts I use, since most of them are just variations of a projectile and I just use whichever element the boss was weak to at the time. After killing Oliver Collins, I comforted fan service Chan and felt something throb in my body. Realizing that I would spiral down into becoming a VTuber watching incel if I allowed this degenerate desire to run its course, 
I attempted to free myself of temptation by piercing my hand with this crystal sea urchin, but it was already too late. Upon seeing the powers of anime reject the crystal's dangerous memory power, Louis invited me to his crib, where several other edgy and questionably legal characters live. I told him that I'm not interested in Prison Sentence Chan and promptly returned to the ruined city. Due to my inability to acquire Icker in any timely sense, leveling up and mastering gifts in this run was a massive chore since I could only take down two or three enemies before I had to go back and rest at the missile. However, I couldn't complain too much since I rarely had to fight any enemies at all if I didn't want to. Just like in Dark Souls, it's possible to just sprint past all of the enemies in almost every area of the game. And that's exactly what I did, picking up every blood veil and vestige along the way just in case I needed them. To save time, I'm mostly just going to talk about the boss fights since nothing really interesting happened in most areas, and most of the items aren't that exciting. Except for one, the Spyhenda. The Spyhenda is the epitome of oversized Animu swords, and it has the highest weapon defense in the entire game, despite being found near the beginning. This high weapon defense meant that it can block nearly all chip damage, and when I fortify it at home base, it actually blocks all chip damage, making me an invincible wall of Icker drainage. Now I could just easily guard drain every boss to restore Icker and then wail on them with gifts, making this run a piece of cake. The next boss was a lubed up slime girl Hatsune Miku, and I simply just blocked every- What the fuck was that shit? The Fextra wiki said I would be able to block any attack, and I clearly have enough stamina, so why isn't this... You gotta be fucking kidding me. Did you- did you see that shit? Let me enlighten you as to what's going on. See that little splash of water? Let me just draw some rectangles, and let's imagine that they're hitboxes. Yeah, that's fucking right. The hitbox goes through me and splashes my ass. And this attack? She goes over my head with a reach around and violates me with her stripper pole spear. Unfucking believable. My entire strategy just crumbled right there. <sighs> On the bright side, at least this run will be more exciting to watch now. Though many attacks can be blocked without chip damage, some are unblockable, and others have hitboxes that can go through you or reach around and hit you in the back. This boss even had a Sekiro style sweep at the legs. In addition to completely destroying my invincible weapon defense strategy, this boss was a tidal wave of bullshit. First off, each attack she uses gradually builds up a debuff called Slow, which prevents your character from running and slows down most of your movements, including getting your guard up. The debuff builds up regardless of whether or not the attacks are blocked, and it builds up insanely quickly. Even when I used a gift that upped resistance and used an item that increased resistance, it only took about two or three hits to get debuffed, and forget about curing it. Even if I managed to get through the insanely slow cure animations, I went right back to being debuffed pretty quickly. In order to overcome this, I started using a gift called Shifting Hollow, which allows a quick dodge no matter how heavy I was. The problem was that if I was locked onto an enemy, my character would only move in that direction. So in order to dodge in any other direction, I had to unlock my camera. In addition to dealing with this annoyance, the gifts cost one ichor per use, so I had to be cautious to always make sure I had enough ichor left over after attacks. One trick I found was that any time she used a long-range ichor blast, all I had to do was take a couple step backwards and I would be able to block it without issue. Speaking of blocking, I had also acquired a gift called Guard Drain Rating Up, which greatly increased the amount of ichor I gained from each successful block. But even with all of these discoveries, the fight was by no means a piece of piss. I had to constantly build up ichor while making sure not to get hit, so each battle lasted quite a while. After enough practice, I finally started reaching phase 2, and boy does she lube herself up with some liquid bullshit. She gained a fast sliding kick that almost always one-shot me if I didn't dodge it. Guarding it was inconsistent, and if I was just out of range, she'd add a sweeping kick that could not be blocked. Additionally, she did a new stripper pole dance that would reach around and stink fist me if I got too close. After transforming my equipment to turn me into a glass cannon, I was successfully able to dodge all of the slides and take her down after nearly 10 minutes of fighting. Consuming the sea urchin I found in Mia's dead brother, I returned to the ruined city center to fight the next boss, the Butterfly of Delirium. 
who was even more rage-inducing than the previous boss. Like the invading Executioner, this boss also inflicted a debuff that cannot be defended against with resistances, but I couldn't just ignore it like I did with the slow debuff. The Venom debuff, as you would suspect, drained my health, and its buildup couldn't be guarded against, which was a huge problem when I needed to guard drain it to make this fight possible. This meant I would either need to cure the Venom with an anti-venom item, which was slow and limited, or with the Venom removal gift, which used the Icker I was so desperately trying to acquire. The battles with this boss were excruciating. I'd use all of my Icker and then guard drain two attacks before having to dodge her bullshit in this tiny ass arena waiting for the debuff to go away, which wouldn't be that much of an issue if her attacks weren't such garbage. Large balls of poison that track you to the ends of the earth, an unblockable spin to win, and worst of all, this charge attack. Every time I wanted to get hit to guard drain, she'd go around. Every time I didn't want to get hit, she'd shove her Black Mamba Stinger right up my ass. In addition to her terrible targeting, she'd shit out these poison gas clouds that I could not predict for the life of me. I felt personally attacked by this move, because I'd feel like I dodged it in the way the game expected me to, only to get punished by a poison cloud because, <laughs> fuck me, right? You know, before this run, I used to like this game. Now, I despise it. That doesn't mean you shouldn't play it. Pre-Traumatized Me still recommends it and is hoping for a sequel. It's just that when I actually had to get good at this game during this run, I encountered so many design flaws and missteps. But truly, it's a pretty good game, so don't take my comments too seriously. Anyway, back to this vomit-inducing pile of putrid bullshit. After over four hours of attempts, with each battle lasting over five minutes, I started to lose hope when I remembered that I had a gift that would make this fight trivial. Blood Sacrifice was the single greatest gift in the entire run, as it allowed me to sacrifice 20% of my health in exchange for 6 Icker. It's a brutal exchange rate, but it allowed me to gain Icker very quickly without having to guard drain. Using it in conjunction with the 5 Icker Concentrate, I simply went fully offensive and was able to generate enough Icker to take her down without much effort. From here on out, the Blood Sacrifice gift was my primary method of gaining Icker throughout the run, but I still tried to use Guard Draining whenever I could since I had a limited amount of health that I could sacrifice. After defeating the boss, I saved a fellow challenge runner who was losing her mind doing a dagger only run, and sprinted to the subsequent area to the next boss, the Insatiable Despot. More like insatiable dick in my ass because he fucking railed me with endless bullshit. When he's alone, this boss is ridiculously easy. His first phase is slow and his attacks are clearly telegraphed, but of course, he's not alone. Whenever he gets the chance, he'll summon two crystals that each birth a minion which were honestly more threatening than the boss itself due to their ungodly speed. I could of course blow up the crystals before they fully spawned, but that would only waste Icker since the boss would just spawn more. I decided once again to become a glass cannon and upped my speed and stamina as much as I could, running circuits around the boss and shooting it from afar. The thing is, these things were so fucking fast and they'd get behind the boss and push him right into me, fucking up my rhythm and getting me killed. There were also invisible walls near the edges of the arena that I'd run into, and worst of all, the camera. This camera never ceases to infuriate me. Similar to how Shifting Hollow required me to unlock the camera to allow unrestricted movement, I had to unlock my camera from the boss if I ever wanted to have a chance at running away from his minions, and locking on, hoo boy, locking on. I always felt like I was perfectly aligned with the boss, but the game really wanted me to lock onto everything but him. Even if the camera did lock onto him, it would switch to his minion without any input from me. After running around in circles numerous times and realizing that the camera was the true boss of this fight, I found that I actually did have enough health to blood sacrifice my way to phase 2, even while destroying the crystals he spawned in. Phase 2 was significantly easier due to the boss losing his summoning ability, and I was able to exploit his huge stature by continually running under him and nailing him with offensive gifts. With the insatiable despot defeated, Mia finally came out of her coma and gave me an unceasing aneurysm with her perpetually loose strap. Taking advantage of her grief-stricken state, I obtained one of the best blood codes in this run, Artemis, and entered the Cathedral of the Sacred Blood. Dude. Fuck this area. Even on my vanilla run, this place was insanely confusing, and in this run, holy shit was it bad. This was one of the only areas in the game in which the average enemies actually gave me trouble. Remember how I said that most enemies can simply be sprinted past? 
Yeah, not these ones. I'd be strolling along and all of a sudden a fucking guillotine would teleport above me. To get through this area, I'd kill as many as I could until I ran out of blood sacrifice and then would just book it and pray I made it to my next goal before I got killed. The boss of this area was the Argent Wolf Berserker, who would have been easy if it weren't for the teleporting dickbags deli slicing my ass on the way there. This boss was the perfect example of what I thought this run was going to be if I was able to block every single attack with this Fihenda. All I had to do was just guard the entire time and cast bloodshots whenever there was an opening. It was a piece of cake, but it was a long piece of cake, taking about 10 minutes to complete. Upon entering my protagonist flashback explaining why I am special and therefore the protagonist, Jack just didn't show up as an ally, so I didn't have to dismiss him, probably due to me not having a partner selected in the first place. I got through the memory without much trouble and met the Queen's Knight. This was one of my favorite bosses to fight because it played like a classic Dark Souls boss. I just had to learn the telegraph moves and dodge the ones that couldn't be blocked. The only thing was this fucking shield blast. I cannot tell you how much I hated this attack. It cannot be blocked, and half the time, it's not telegraphed at all. He does use it at the end of this combo, which was no problem, but he can also just use it whenever the fuck he wants. I was shit-talking it on stream, and of course the sentient son of a bitch heard me and just spammed it three times in a row. I never figured out how to predict or avoid it when it wasn't in the combo. There's also this thrust attack, which can be blocked some of the time, but not all of the time, depending on how much the game hated me at that moment. In phase two, he gains new attacks, the most notable being these two sky attacks followed by an explosion. But because the camera continues to lock on, I literally just held L1 and sidestepped the blast. This boss was pretty fast paced and I was constantly guard draining to build Icker, so I couldn't just constantly unleash shit. But after enough practice and luck with the shield bashes, I defeated the Queen's Knight without too much stress. In the cutscene, the aneurysm I had incurred from Mia's loose strap became apparent when I attacked the Queen with the hilt of my sword, rather than the massive sharp metal bit. Nevertheless, I defeated the Queen and was subsequently betrayed by Jack, which in my head canon was the traumatic event that caused Gift Chan to refuse having any partners in the run. And that's it for part one. Part Are two is chock full of even more degeneracy and the most difficult that. challenge I've faced in a run yet. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in part two.